Mm -hmm. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight is actually the seventh and final session of our, you can barely even see it now, Manifestation of Lights Sutra. Um, so this is this will be the conclusion of this sutra, but this is by no means the end of the sutra. So let's start there this evening, just with a kind of a quick recap. Um, so as everybody knows on Sunday nights for many, many months now, if not years, we've been making our way through all of the beautiful sutras in this collection of Mahayana sutras. And the one I chose to do was this uh, Rashmisha Manta Mukta Nardesha Sutra. This, the question about the manifestation of lights. And when I first read it, I thought, oh, this is a beautiful little sutra. Um, it's a very, basically a very long poem, beautiful ideas. And I thought, oh, it would be a great kind of conclusion to the, to the year. But as everybody knows, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, this translation has a few problems. And one of the problems is that they, they tend to leave a lot of things out. When I first read this, I didn't read the Chinese. I just read the English translation. And I noticed that there was a few uh, lacuna, a few uh, gaps in the text. But normally in other sutras, a gap would be maybe, you know, a few words, a paragraph, a few sentences. So I thought, okay, little did I know that the editors of this collection, I didn't realize that they truncated and abridged this to no end. It really basically is that the sutra in this book, this particular version, this, it doesn't match the real sutra at all. I mean, you're missing so much that they've kind of constructed their own sutra in a way. So that being the case, I'm making no attempt to make a clean uh, conclusion to this series. Um, we'll revisit this sutra when I get around to translating the rest of it. Uh, and then so maybe next year at Christmas time, we'll do part two in that way. So rather than sort of pushing through and really trying to get our way to the end of this, I've chosen just a few sections to read from. I'm going to try my best to kind of recap what's been said, or actually what I plan to do is restate a few things I've said along the way that I think are relevant. Um, yeah, and then we're just going to read a little bit. Again, I think it's a beautiful sutra with beautiful ideas. We're just sort of missing the, the larger point of this sutra a, a little bit. I'm going to do my best tonight to at least point at the point, like at least, you know, indicate what the point of the sutra is in that way. So if you've been coming, you know that this has just been a very, very long answer that the Buddha is giving to our little boy named Moonlight. So this little boy who used to be here, but now he's just the entire moon, he, he is called or he's known as Moonlight. And he asks the Nirdesha, Nirdesha means a question. He asks the question about, or he asks for advice, I guess, about the lights of the, the Buddha. And the Buddha then proceeds to give this very long poem. And we just reached a point last week where the sutra that we're reading started talking a lot about the sutra we're reading. <laughs> like it became in, in, the, in a very, a way that many Mahayana sutras do, the sutra became self-referential in a really interesting way. 
And the Buddha started to talk about, in fact, the last thing that I read was this part of the sutra where the Buddha was talking about in all of these past lives, he performed all of these virtuous acts. He made all of these offerings, gave all of this charity um, for hundreds of thousands of kalpas in all of these different realms of existence, all just to obtain this sutra. And so that's where I left it off last time was the Buddha saying, by the way, Moonlight, this sutra is so amazing. I went through lifetime after lifetime after lifetime of practice just to encounter this sutra, just the language of the, the actual language of the text is about doing all of this for the sake of this sutra. And that it's actually kind of ambiguous in terms of, well, what does that mean? Like, like, what does it mean? Well, let's go a little bit further tonight. So we are going a little further, but again, I'm just going to read from this section. And I don't really have a huge agenda this evening as far as how far we get. So let's see. Um, and also, I don't plan on reading every single stanza of the poem because that would be a lot. So the Buddha tells little boy Moonlight, in the past, for the sake of this sutra, for the sake of hearing it, for the sake of obtaining it, for the sake of acquiring the knowledge that's in it, we're not really sure, but in the past, for the sake of this sutra, I kept or observed the pure precepts, cultivating meditation and wisdom, and giving generously to all sentient beings. In the past, for the sake of this sutra, I showed sympathy on villains or evil people who came to harm me. And instead of, it actually says in the Chinese, I gave sympathy upon them instead of adding to the harm. It's an unfortunate that they didn't translate it right because it's a beautiful sentiment. He says, in the past, for the sake of this sutra, I took sympathy upon villains who scolded me or came to harm me rather than adding to the harm. In the past, for the sake of this sutra, I fulfilled the wishes of those who came asking me for favors, making them happy. And then this is where they start leaving out stanzas left and right, and really it it just doesn't go well after that because the, the stanzas don't make any sense one after another because they've removed them. So I wanna jump ahead a little bit to this nice part. So the Buddha then says, moonlight, you should know, just as a clever person can skillfully handle fire to cook various dishes without being burned by it, while a clumsy fool burns the palm of their hand with the fire. And just as one becomes stupefied and deranged when taking poison, it can be cured through the fire of moksabushin. And so it is with the wise. By means of the mind, they realize that the mind is empty so they are able to abide peacefully in samsara. So I'm gonna pause there. So that's a very beautiful sentiment, statement. So the other part that we read last week, it was the focus of last week's session was very much on, well, what the Buddha just said, the emptiness of the I. The, the sutra, the, the Buddha in the sutra, he actually uses a lot of different terminology, talking about the ultimate quiescence of the eye, the um, ultimate exhaustion of the eye, the limits of the eye. And then all of those ideas culminated in a few stanzas that were specifically about the emptiness of the eye. And let us not forget that the sutra also makes it clear 
that everything that is being said about the eye goes for the ear, the nose, or ears, the nose, the tongue, mouth, body, and brain. So the whole kit and caboodle of the sentient subject, the whole kit and caboodle of this is empty in that sense. And so this sutra, even though it didn't seem like it was going to do it, you know, we were, we were, we were spending a lot of time in this sutra praising the Tathagata, praising the Buddha, praising the wisdom of the Buddha, praising the meritorious acts of the Buddha. And at the beginning of this sutra, it started to seem like this might just be one of those kind of pure land sutras that's kind of devotional. It's kind of about the, the lauding, the wisdom of the Buddha. But then, sure enough, the sutra started to get into some deeper dharma until finally we arrived at this section about the emptiness of the eye. And this sutra is definitely, and what we're going to read tonight will get there, but it's definitely making a very clear relationship between the manifestation of lights the, of the Buddha and the emptiness of the eye. And so tonight we kind of really want to be trying to, well, I, I'm going to be trying to wrap all of these ideas up. There's so many different threads in this sutra that I'm going to try to tie together, but it does have a lot to do with light, <laughs> with seeing and eyes and vision and, and all of that. And so this will be my first um, digression. I just want to remind you of some comments I made at the opening. So at session one of this sutra, when I introduced this topic of the lights, or when the sutra introduced the topic of the Buddha emitting all of these lights, in that opening, those few opening uh, pages, it even the sutra makes it clear that light, like like lamp light, what it calls, you know, basically the light of the five colors but that's a specific language to refer to like light. That was only one of the kinds of lights emitted by the Buddha, <laughs> meaning the normal regular light that we think about. There was all kinds of other lights. And what I suggested in the opening in the, our first session was to be thinking, it, it would probably be helpful to be thinking about the role of light as it pertains to knowledge, to knowing things. And the example I gave was being in a dark room, not knowing what was, what was in the room. So therefore being ignorant about what was in the room, what was going on. And a lamp or a light that would show you, oh, look, it's a chair, a table, this and that. There's a direct relationship between the light and you knowing what's in the room. So there's a really interesting relationship just in the regular old world. There's a really interesting relationship between light and knowledge, that light leads to knowledge. And when we are in the dark, we can't see, and we kind of don't know what's going on. And so what I suggested in the very opening session was that in the same way that light, light, light can tell me and inform me about what's going on, and therefore light, light, regular light could lead to knowledge. What if you had some information what if you had some not a piece of truth? Like, and the example I gave was like the Four Noble Truths. So a teaching that was about what was causing suffering. And this teaching that a kind of cravenous wanting and desiring is what's causing us anxiety and stress, that there's a, a relationship between those two. And if you analyze it carefully, you can begin to notice that the wanting 
produces a, uh, um, anxiety and stress or dukkha. And as you ease up on this wanting, the dukkha diminishes. So that's a teaching. That's, of course, part of the Four Noble Truths. And what I suggested was, is that if, if that resonates, if a teaching or a dharma or wisdom resonates and, and you move from a state of not understanding why you're suffering, not understanding what's going on here, and then you hear the dharma or you hear the Four Noble Truths, and you come to an understanding of what is causing you stress and anxiety and dukkha. Well, the idea is, is that that knowledge is like a light. It's not a lamp light, but it's done the same thing where it has illuminated what's going on here. And so I strongly suggested thinking of all of these other lights that the sutra is talking about of thinking about them in those contexts, not as light that you would see with your eye, but light that you might see with your mind in that way. So I wanted to mention that so that as we dive deeper into the emptiness of the eye, of which they're talking about the physical eyeball in your head, the emptiness of the eye Ha has something to do with these other lights and understanding or even possibly seeing these other lights. So, so I just wanted to remind you of that. And then I want to go back to this very interesting analogy. So the Buddha says, just as a clever person can skillfully handle fire, to cook their various dishes without being burned by it, right? So it is with the wise. And I left out the second example. Let's just focus on the first example, this idea of somebody being able to cook without burning their hands, right? But then it says, while a clumsy fool burns their hands, right? So it is with the wise. By means of the mind, they realize that the mind is empty so they are able to peacefully abide in samsara. So that's not even the emptiness of the I. That's the emptiness of the mind itself in that way. Um, the reason why I mentioned the I is because the very next stanza is, by means of the I, they realize that the I is empty and they do not attach themselves to it. Knowing this truth, or actually knowing like this, the I, knowing like this, they use the eyes without affliction. By realizing the emptiness of the eye, one can achieve knowledge of Buddha Tathata, the truth, we'll get back to that, but they will know the truth. And thereby manifest or emit various lights. Okay, so that's kind of actually the section I wanted to focus on tonight. If we don't get any further than that, that'll be fine. So this interesting analogy of this idea of being able to cook with fire without burning yourself. Similarly, by means of the mind, realizing that the mind is empty, therefore abiding peacefully in samsara, and by means of the I, realizing that the I is empty, not attaching themselves to the I, they know the truth like this, or they know like this, and then therefore they can use the eyes without affliction. Okay, so. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so obviously, when we're talking about the emptiness of the mind or emptiness of the eye, we're talking about this very important Buddhist idea of emptiness that we talk about basically every Sunday night at the Dharma doors, because that's just how it goes. I, you know me, I've got all these different ways of talking about it, uh, emptiness, 
Um, we had fun last week talking about emptiness of a variety of subjects. Tonight, tonight I want to, um, I think I want to drop a, a new one on you in that sense. Um, just a different way to think about emptiness. It's the same idea. Everything I've ever, ever said is the same, but I'm just going to introduce you to yet another way to think about this. So it has to do with, let me, um, yeah, I think this will be interesting. So the example that I've given in the past is about this one. And the idea of this as an object, right? And even the object, we might even call a clock. So let, let, me, let me be very, very art, um, clear about my language, right? An object, one object, right? And it's a clock. One, it's, one, it's definitely not two clocks, it's a clock. So one aspect of emptiness, so there's a lot of different aspects to this teaching of emptiness, but one of the aspects about emptiness is about this sort of taking what is a multiple. So this has a button, it's got a plastic face, there's a battery in there, it's got little knobs, it's got different colors, it's got the little hands. It's a bunch of punch, a bunch of little things. And these little things are kind of all, you know, together. And then the mind sort of just holds it. Even my hand holds it as one object. And not only does it hold it as one object sort of in space, but more importantly, it holds it as one object, like, like one thing, <laughs> even though it's not, it's not one thing. And we know intellectually that it's not, yet we have this word, and it's really actually interesting how the word and the object sort of are right there, as, as far as like, there it is. So one of the things, one of the aspects of emptiness is that it has to do with that, that singularity, as I would call it, meaning that the idea that there's one thing and it's called a clock, yeah, that's empty. And that's empty, if, you know, again, for a variety of reasons, but the idea is, is that it's not, it, it's not that simple. It's not just one thing. Yet, the, the fact that the mind just has this one word for it and then wraps it up. And it has to have, of course, a lot to do with use, the function, the idea that, that this is useless if it's not part of this. So it's, you know, it's easy for the mind to like move into that feeling of there being some one thing there. And if you can, if you're following me, and of course this is, should just be review in that way. If you're following me, then you also are ready for the next step, which is realizing that the button, <laughs> the, oh, look, it's another one of those words, button. And even though this is also a collection of Maybe we're talking at a uh, molecular level. Maybe we're talking at you know different levels. The button is also a multiple that the mind can hold as a singularity, the button. And so the button is empty too. So not just the clock, but the button, meaning all of the constituent elements, those are empty too. And then it just keep, keeps going and keeps going until there's the kind of the great realization about the emptiness of the perceiver, the emptiness of the one who thinks they're even holding a clock or looking at a clock. Because the idea, the deep, deep, deep Dharma is that this teaching of emptiness applies to all dharmas. Anything that is a word is one of those singularities. 
So I tell you all of this because there's another singularity and it's called the eyeball. Now we could get really, you know, um, scientific about this in that way. And what I mean by that is, is, is we talk about the eyes, but where does the eye end and the brain begin, let's say, or where does the, you know, we have these clear delineated ideas about the eyes and the ears and the nose, but where do they actually begin and end? Aren't they too a word or a concept for a multiple? Because of course the eyeball is the iris, the cornea, the pupil, the, you know, you got all kinds of different things going on in the eye. And so if you're following the logic about the emptiness of the clock and the button, then the emptiness of the eye should be perfectly clear in that way. But of course, you might think you're using your eyes to see this in that way. And so there's a little bit more at stake in the emptiness of the eyes than in the emptiness of the clock in that sense. So what I mean is, is that when we think about like objects and concepts, it's kind of easy to start breaking them down and then kind of realizing that they're all kind of conceptual. Where this gets really interesting and tricky is when it's this. And so now let me read this again really quickly, right? So it is with, so it is with the wise. By means of the mind, they realize that the mind is empty. So they are able to peacefully abide in samsara. By means of the eye, they realize that the eye is empty and do not attach themselves to it. Knowing this truth or knowing like this, they can use the eye without affliction. So first of all, I hope everybody caught my transition there that it's, e it's one thing to be dealing with the clock. It's another thing to be, to be, you know, using the mind to understand the emptiness of the mind, using the eyes to understand the emptiness of the eyes. That's a little clearly more subtle. And it also though might seemingly sound either paradoxical or mm, just something not right there. It might, and hopefully we can kind of unknot un the problem in that way. So one of the things, and let me see, yeah, let me just do it this way to actually like teach some Dharma tonight. So last week, I also had reason to, um, well, I had reason to quote from the Heart Sutra a bunch. Um, and I, in fact, I think I was talking about this Dharma last week, also dealing with the emptiness of this concept or this idea, this reified entity. And in doing that, I went through the Heart Sutra talking about how the role of toilet paper doesn't arise or cease, is neither pure nor defiled, and doesn't increase or decrease. So I went through the Heart Sutra using this roll of toilet paper, but one thing I didn't mention about the Heart Sutra last week, which is directly applicable to this, is that in that tiny short little sutra, when it's talking about how all dharmas are empty, they don't come or go, they're neither pure nor impure, and when it's talking about all of that, it then goes on to say that within emptiness, there is no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or brain. There is no visible form, no auditory sounds, no olfactory sense, 
no flavors, no tactile sensations, and actually no thoughts. So that's sort of where we're at in this sutra. And so I want to walk you through this idea of the emptiness of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and brain. And in a sense that, again, this idea of the empty nature of these things. So as to get back to this seemingly paradoxical idea of using the eyes to see the emptiness of the eyes. So the example that I always, 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 always give when explaining or talking about the Heart Sutra and that part of it, the emptiness of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and brain, I often always use the dream analogy. The example, the idea being that when you're in a dream, but it's one of those dreams that you think is good old fashioned reality, good old fashioned the world. When you're in one of those dreams, you see things all the time. That's part of the idea that there's visual phenomena, visual sights in a dream. You actually probably hear things in a dream. You could go so far as to smell things in a dream. You could taste things in a dream. You could certainly touch and feel things in a dream. Now, the question is, in a dream where you're seeing things and hearing things and smelling things and tasting things and touching things, are you using your eyes to see? Are you using your ears to hear? Are you using your nose to smell? Well, considering that in a dream, you're actually asleep and your eyes are closed, Usually it's very quiet in your room because people often like to sleep in silence. Um, and if you're smelling something, it's not with this nose. If you're smelling something in a dream, it's not with this nose. If you're, if you're touching something in a dream, it's not with these hands. So that's an interesting thing to think about from the point of view of emptiness, which is this idea that in a dream, you see things, but you don't see them with your eyes. That's very interesting. In fact, we could go that extra step and say that in a dream, you don't have eyes, right? You don't have a nose. You don't have ears. You don't have a tongue. You don't have a body. And now, regarding the sixth sensory organ, what I just keep referring to as the brain. Here's the, the thing about being in a dream is that when you're in a dream and you think it's reality and you think you have eyes and you think you have ears and a nose and a tongue and you think you're feeling things, you also think you're embodied. Like, and, and to the point where if somebody, you know, in a dream came at you, you know, with a knife, You'd, you'd move out of the way because you would be protecting your body, even though you don't actually have a body. Well, what's happening then is you then also think you have a incranium encased brain in that dream, meaning that you might think you're doing your thinking with your brain in that dream. But remember, you're asleep, your head's on the pillow. And so the thinking agent or the thinking apparatus is not the thinking apparatus that you think it is in the dream. And that's the emptiness of that sixth sensory organ. This idea that you think you're an embodied being. So I wanted to remind you of that in terms of a way of thinking, which is that you are capable of seeing without eyeballs. <laughs> You're capable of hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and even thinking in that sense without the sensory organs. Also, by the way, let me remind you of the first part of it. The things that we're looking at, they're dream things. 
and therefore they're empty. They don't have any substantial nature. They don't have any svabhava, as it would be called, any self nature. They're, they're actually, if you understand or think deeply about the nature of a dream, you're lying with your head on the pillow and you're dreaming the whole thing, meaning both the thing that you think you're seeing and the person who you think is seeing the thing, you're both sides of it. But in the dream, you only think you're one side of it, meaning you think you're the, the, the receiver of the light, the receiver of the sounds, the receiver of the smells. But again, from the dream dreamer perspective, you're both sides of it. And that's actually, it's why I'm so um, keen on always using the dream analogy is because it's an excellent example of delusion. It's in fact, it's the perfect example of delusion because we experience it all the time when we wake up and be like, oh, I had this crazy dream and I thought it was real, but it wasn't. So that's sort of this idea of, well, that puts us in, in the direction of the emptiness of the eye. Of course, what we're really talking about is not <laughs> dream states. <laughs> We're actually talking about this state that you're in right now, this state of being in which you too also feel embodied that you're using eyes to see things and using your ears to hear things and so on. And you also probably think that you're only on the receiving end of all of this media, that you're only a receiver of this. And the teaching of emptiness is actually about how it's closer to that dream where you are both sides of this. But part of the habit of mind, part of the samskara or the conditioning of mind is a dualistic sense of subject and object. And the idea is, is that if you want to like, again, I would really encourage you to think about that dream scenario because in the dream it's the same samskara it's the same hab habit of dualizing where you're like oh what's that over there i bet i could use that and then you and then you want it and you go after it buddhism is basically saying the same thing about this reality too I know this seems very subject object, but it's, it's the same kind of habit of mind that's creating this sense of things. And so when this text talks about the wise, understanding the emptiness of the mind or the emptiness of the eye, they're talking about applying that same kind of dream logic to this reality and understanding how it could be that the eye is empty in that sense. Now, we need to, I'm going to talk about something very serious in a second. So this says, by means of the mind, and they're talking about someone who's wise, by means of the mind, they realize that the mind is empty. And so they are able to abide in life and death you usually translate that as samsara, but the actual language is so they are able to abide peacefully in life and death, but that's code for the cycle of life and death or samsara. By means of the eye, they realize that the eye is empty and do not attach themselves to it. Knowing this truth or knowing like this they can use the eyes without affliction. By realizing the emptiness of the eye, one can achieve knowledge of Buddha Tathata, true suchness, and thereby manifest these various lights. All right. So, I mean, if we could get through all of that, that that would be the, the heart of the sutra in that way. 
because it's that line, or at least this kind of uh, few few lines, are really all the different themes of this sutra coming together. And so the one that we really want to focus on is this idea of Buddha Tathata. So if you have the the Chang translation, <clears throat> they of course just translate this as by realizing the emptiness of the eye, one can achieve true wisdom. Indeed, true wisdom, but it's helpful to know that it actually is if one who understands the emptiness of the eye can achieve knowledge of this Buddha Tathata. So this is a big, one of those big, crazy Sanskrit words. It's B-H-U-T-A, Buddha Tathata. It sounds like Buddha, Buddha, but it's Buddha and then Tathata. And both of those words are rather tricky to translate. And then when you put them together, it gets even more difficult to translate. It's usually why translators just call it true wisdom or something like that. Um, let's work backwards. So Tathata is this teaching or this Buddhist idea of suchness as it isness. And um, a, a really good example that I like to give for tathata or suchness, it, it's the idea of imagining that there's two people and one person takes a hallucinogen and starts to see things, uh, you know, big crazy balloons in the room. Another person who has not taken a hallucinogen doesn't see the balloons. In normal, regular, um, kind of like reality as defined by physics and science, sort of normal conventional views of reality, one of those people is hallucinating and the other person isn't. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is that the way that we normally think about that scenario is that the person who took the hallucinogen is seeing things that aren't there. They're fake, they're, they're mirages, they're illusions. And the sense of it is that the other person that didn't take the hallucinogen, the sense is that they're seeing what's really there. Now, I don't need to tell you if you've been studying with me or Dharma doors for a while that the teaching of Buddhism is, or one of the teachings of Buddhism is about how that idea that one of those people is wrong and one of them is right. Buddhism is more about actually neither of them is right. And also simultaneously, neither of them is wrong. And the point is, is this, the person who took the hallucinogen is really seeing a hallucination. <laughs> they, they're really seeing that. And the idea is, is that that vision of those big balloons is, <clears throat> a product or at least dependently originated, but it's dependent upon this substance that this person ate. You could kind of think of it as a byproduct of their diet. And what Buddhism is suggesting is, is that the person that doesn't see the balloons, that's a byproduct of their diet. <laughs> and so the idea here is, is that if you can get with that, and basically what we're talking about and what I often talk about is that in Buddhism, there's no objective reality. There is not one definitive object of reality that all people are viewing. We are actually all each in our own hallucination based upon basically our diet in a lot of ways diet of food, but also diet of media, diet of information, all kinds of things. And so the idea of 
tathata or suchness is it's about the reality of those balloons that person is seeing. They're not real balloons. Yeah, we know that. But there's really the experience of seeing these balloons. And so the idea is that if you can kind of get into that way of thinking or that, that way of seeing, then suchness or tathata is about the experience of seeing these balloons and that it, be, it actually be happening. Despite the fact that they're not real, but ultimately, of course, the teaching here regarding emptiness is that all of these things are like hallucinations, all, including the self and the eyes and all of that. All of these things are like those balloons, which is to say, tathata, they are such. You, this is an experience that you're really having, and it, it looks like this, and it is like this. And it, the idea is as though all of this, it has the same reality as those balloons, meaning it has no reality, yet it has this reality as tathata. And that brings me to buddha tathata. So buddha means, it literally means like a substance. So you could think of buddha tathata as the substance of suchness. Well, what are hallucinatory balloons made out of? Like, what are they made out of? If you're saying to yourself, mind, <laughs> then you're definitely on the, on the right path in that way. Because that's the idea of this tathata, is that it's about experience in that sense. It's about direct experience with what's actually in front of you. And the idea here is, and kind of what I want to get back to, is that in the same way that I just said that there's a kind of reality to these balloons, but the reality is them as an experience. There's no actual like hot air in the balloon in that way. It's important to keep that in mind, this sort of like, they're not real, but they're such. And that's what's being said about the eyes and also the mind too, by the way. And so now that we have this better understanding, or at least a clearer definition of Buddha Tathata, this idea that by realizing the emptiness of the I, one can achieve knowledge of Buddha Tathata and thereby manifest various lights. So now we're back to the manifestation of lights, which comes from this knowledge of suchness. One of the things that I would just throw in, I would just, I'm just going to throw it in just like a Dharma bomb. Just like, I, if we are, if we get what's what I'm talking about regarding tathata, buddha tathata, and if you totally get what I'm talking about regarding the real but not real nature of these balloons, then in that, in that Buddha Tathata realm, what do we do with light? And now I'm talking about real light, like actual lamp light, sunlight, physical light. If you're following everything I'm talking about, about the emptiness of all phenomena, emptiness of all dharmas in that way, but the sort of suchness of things, then what do we do with light as a non-existent suchness in that way? What I'm getting at, by the way, too, because I'm alluding to something I said, I think either in the first or the second session, 
But I always like to ask this very provocative question, which is, what is the source of illumination in a dream? Like, what, what actually makes things visible in a dream? Including, like, uh, if you had a lamp and could see the light of the lamp dancing on the walls, right? Once again, we're, we're peeking back at the mind as the, the generator of these things in that way. And so I just kind of wanted to, when it says this idea that one who realizes the emptiness of the eye can eradicate, oh, this is an ex, uh, actually the next line. One who realizes the emptiness of the eye can eradicate tanha, desire, forever. Free of desire, they manifest various lights. So this was alluded to in the previous section, and now this one, which is this relationship between someone understanding the emptiness of the I and thereby eradicating desire, or as it said before, using the I without affliction. So, you know, again, the basic teaching here regard, well, I alluded to the Four Noble Truths earlier, but this basic teaching regarding wanting and desiring in that way, one who realizes the emptiness of the I, right, eradicates desire forever. And if you, if you, you know, wanted to put that together, just think about this, you know, example, imagine, Imagine you were, you, imagine you were sh uh, uh, low on money for your rent and the end of the month's coming up. And then you start, you in the night, you have a dream, but you think it's reality. And somebody's got a big envelope of all this money, right? And you remember, oh, wow, I got to pay my rent in a week or so. And that's a big old envelope of money. You may, <laughs> I would imagine, you may desire that big old envelope of money. Now, remember, you think this is reality. You don't know you're dreaming. So it would make kind of perfect sense for you to be like, wow, I could use that big envelope of money to pay my rent. And then you would want it. You would desire it right? But then what would happen if at that moment that let's say even the, the person with the big old envelope of money was like, yeah, sure, you can have it. And so you were reaching out to grab it and you know, your heart was so excited because you were, you know, and then something happens and you realize you're dreaming. And so you, you start to have like what's called a lucid dream, right? All of a sudden you realize, oh, this is a dream. How desirable is that envelope of money now? Can you use it to pay your rent? Couldn't you use it at all? Or is it, it's a mirage. It's not real. And so the idea is, is that if you were actually in that scenario where you went from, oh, perfect, exactly what I needed. And then you realize that it wasn't real. It was all a dream. Again, how desirable would that money be? Well, the idea is, is it wouldn't be desirable at all. And it's not that it would be undesirable either, because it's not like you would be offended by it or insulted by it, because it's a dream. It's dream money. So you, it would just be, well, it would be empty, but it would also be such or tathata -ta, because there it is. And, you know, I don't know if you, if you've had a lucid dream, but one of the most interesting things about a lucid dream is the, the way that 
often nothing changes. The only thing that changes is your disposition towards your environment. You might have been afraid of it one minute, then you have a lucid experience, and now you're like, oh, I don't have to be afraid of this. Or you might have been desirous of something in the dream. And upon lucidity, you, you're looking at the same envelope of money you were looking at a second ago, but you are wiser in that you are now having a lucid dream. And you know, oh, this is empty. This isn't real. It's not desirable. Well, this is applying it to this plane of existence or this reality in the same way. It's suggesting that one who realizes the emptiness of the I, right, can eradicate desire forever, it says. And I would suggest it's from the same type of waking up, the same realization about the phenomenal empty nature of all phenomena, and then the ultimate undesirability of everything by virtue of being empty and yet still such that's the the lesson tonight is much more about this suchness we did emptiness last week tonight it's about this idea that even though even though my clock is empty behold regard <laughs> right the clock so emptiness is this really subtle teaching because it's like a lucid dream in that it's like, oh, wow, the clock's empty. Look, <laughs> behold. Okay, so perfect. So we got through the bulk of it. So now I just want to read a little bit now that we really have like, or I, I hope, we have a really solid grasp of these key ideas, emptiness, suchness, the lights, and all of that. So once again, one who realizes the emptiness of the eye can eradicate desire forever. Free of desire, they can manifest various lights. As it is with desire, so it is with hatred ignorance, clinging to the self, pretenses, distress, avarice, jealousy, shamelessness, intolerance, conceit, pride, arrogance, flattery, deceit, self-indulgence, fraud, and so on. One who acquires knowledge of Buddha Tathata will abide in the essence of the Buddha Dharma and will then be able to manifest these various lights. One who acquires knowledge of Buddha Tathata will abide in the skillful means of the Buddha, the Upaya of the Buddha, and will then be able to manifest these various lights. Never have I seen anyone able to manifest these lights who has not cultivated knowledge of Buddha Tathata and thereby freeing themselves forever from the hindrances and afflictions. One who cultivates knowledge of Buddha Tathata with diligence will free themselves forever from hindrances and afflictions, and one who complies with this practice can manifest these various lights. Okay, so it goes on, the poem goes on like this for quite a long time, of which they leave out, they leave out a bunch of stanzas, but it's all about this idea of one who cultivates this knowledge of Buddha Tathata can acquire, it's things like they can acquire the merits of the Buddha, they can acquire the, the eyes of a Buddha, so all of these qualities of a Buddha, and they can manifest all of these lights. And of course, it then ends by saying, and the same is true with the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. 
as well as visible forms, sounds, sense, te taste, text, textures, and mental thoughts. So that concludes that part. And then for the first time since the beginning of the sutra, at that time, the young boy Moonlight, having heard this Dharma explained, felt great joy. And in the presence of the Buddha, he praised the Tathagata in verse saying, the Tathagata, the Buddha, can display pure wisdom for due to realizing the ultimate exhaustion of the eye being able to display pure wisdom. He is endowed with the Tathagata's pure lights. The Tathagata can utter pure voices by understanding that the I has no self. Being able to utter pure voices, they are endowed with the Tathagata's perfect voice. Buddhas can utter pure speech benefiting sentient beings. With the ability to utter pure speech, they benefit innumerable worlds. The Tathagata can achieve the wisdom of Dharanis, mnemonics, by realizing that the I is empty by nature. Being able to achieve the wisdom of Dharanis, they manifest the infinite lights of the Tathagata. The Tathagata knows the variations of different eyes and their unlimited varying names. Knowing the countless names of the eyes, they emit the Tathagata's infinite lights. Knowing the varieties of words and languages, the Buddha realizes that the eye is empty and beyond all words. Therefore, emitting the Buddha's or the Tathagata's infinite lights. If one ponders that the eye is devoid of self, they will know that the Buddha speaks the true Buddha Tathata. And one who knows that the Buddha speaks the true Buddha Tathata can manifest the Tathagata's absolute definitive light. Having achieved the supreme miraculous Siddhis, the supernatural powers, the Tathagata realizes the destruction of infinite numbers of eyes. Being able to realize the destruction of infinite numbers of eyes, the Tathagata can benefit the world. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, thoroughly realizes the arising of infinite numbers of eyes. May I too soon realize the eyes arising, just as the Buddha does. So may it be with the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind, and visible form, sound, sense, textures, tastes, and mental objects as well. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, has perfected the paramita of giving. May I soon attain the paramita of giving, just as the Buddha has. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, has perfected the paramita of pure shila, moral discipline. May I soon attain the paramita of pure shila just as the Buddha does. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, has attained the paramita of patience, kushanti. May I soon attain the paramita of patience, just as the Buddha has. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, has attained the paramita of determination, virya, May I soon attain the paramita of virya, just as the Buddha has. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, has attained the paramita of dhyana, meditation. 
may I soon attain the paramita of dhyana, just as the Buddha has. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, has attained the paramita of pranya wisdom. May I soon attain the paramita of pranya, just as the Buddha has. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, has attained the perfect dharma kaya, the perfect dharma body. May I soon attain the perfect dharma body, just as the Buddha has. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, is endowed with infinite pure form. May I too soon acquire infinite pure form, just as the Buddha has. The supremely honored one among humans and gods, the one of great compassion, has achieved the pure limitless mind. May I soon acquire the same pure limitless mind, just as the Buddha has. Okay, and this goes on. This goes on for pages and pages and pages and pages. Um, I just wanted to give you a taste of that section. And again, this is Moonlight. And this is the first time we've heard from Moonlight since the beginning of the sutra when he asked the question, how does the Buddha attain all these lights? So his poem is rather long and they leave a lot of, a lot of it out. Um, and it's mainly this idea of you know, um, for example, fully realizing the flux and change of samsara, the Tathagata is not perplexed by it. May I too achieve the wisdom that is not perplexed by the flux and flow of samsara, just as the Buddha has. So they're all like that. And the, the one thing, just the one thing that I want to say about that section it, and it has to do with just Mahayana Buddhism in general. When you encounter a sutra like this, that is praising the Buddha, lauding the Tathagata, I know that it, at first blush, it can seem not Buddhist. <laughs> like I know th that. And the one thing where it is very Buddhist is the idea of all of this is that each of us can attain that state. And so if that weren't the case, yeah, that would be something else in a way. That would sort of be a devotional form of theism or something to that effect. But the idea here is Moonlight's like, yeah, I, I want to achieve that too. And of course, that is the whole point of this. So I just wanted to kind of emphasize that about a sutra like this. Any reference to the Buddha or the Tathagata, it's, it's truly an ide ideal in that sense, not a historical figure, certainly not a god or divine being or something like that. Okay, so I will let you know that at a certain point, Maitreya, the future Buddha, steps in and Maitreya has a few things to say, um, also in, in the same gist of praising the Buddha, praising the Tathagata. So we're doing a very, very quick fast forward to the more or less the end of the sutra. And I wanted to do this because it kind of really puts a nice conclusion on, on this series. So after Maitreya, after a bunch more uh, abridgment, we finally get to the end, or what is more or less the end. And the Buddha said, or thereupon, amid the assembly, the world honored one, the Buddha, patted moonlight on the head with his golden hued hand, and then spoke in verse Moonlight. Listen carefully. I now entrust you with this teaching of enlightenment, the sutra on the manifestation of lights, so that in a latter time, when the Dharma is about to perish, you can reveal it and expound it to sentient beings. 
numberless kalpas in the past, there was a Buddha named Dipankara, the lamplighter. And I, as a wandering ascetic named Manavaka, offered flowers to that Buddha. Thereupon, Dipankara prophesied that I would become a Buddha named Shakyamuni, and that I would sit at the site of enlightenment to expound this sutra. You, Moonlight, were then just a little boy, and hearing the prophecy about my future attainment of Buddhahood, you felt joy, and you became pure in mind. You vowed with your palms joined, if Manavaka becomes a Buddha, I will assist him in his preaching, and I will protect and uphold his dharma after his passing away. When Dipankara, the lamplighter Buddha, explained this sutra on the manifestation of lights, both Manavaka and the boy listened and held the sutra dear. Once in the past, I offered blue lotus flowers to that Buddha Dipankara, and you were present on that occasion and vowed to accept and uphold this sutra and preach it and circulate it widely in the last era of the Dharma. One who, upon hearing this Dharma, who does not feel aversion, but accepts, upholds, reads, and recites this sutra is indeed a person of virtue. You should, in latter ages, uphold this seldom heard sutra and elucidate its meaning widely for all sentient beings. And when the World Honored One finished teaching this sutra, the boy Moonlight and everyone in the assembly, including the devas and the humans and asuras, gandharavas, nagas, and so forth throughout all the world were all jubilant over the Buddha's teaching. They accepted it with faith and began to practice it with veneration. Okay, so that's the conclusion of the sutra. So that last little part of it is a kind of an interesting addition. So many of you are probably familiar with the scenario that I just read, but if you're not, this is a very famous moment in kind of Buddhist, well, you could call it Buddhist mythology, there is a technical field called Buddhology. So it's a, the science of Buddhas. And this is a big moment. And what this is, is it's an often spoken about previous life of the Buddha. When the Buddha was just this wandering ascetic named Manavaka, or yeah, Manavaka. And there's this story that at that time, and, and again, this is kalpas and kalpas and kalpas in the past. But at that time, there was a Buddha named Dipankara. And that word means lighter of lamps or the lamp lighter. And the story is, is that the wandering ascetic, Manavaka, heard that there was a Buddha in town and that they were going to have a parade for this Buddha Dipankara. And so, that Manavaka gathered up all of these blue lotus flowers, ran to the parade, and when the Buddha Dipankara came walking by, he showered him with his blue lotus flowers. And that Buddha Dipankara made a prediction and said, you, Manavaka, in a future life will be a Buddha named Shakyamuni. Now, this is a famous um, Buddhist story, or again, part of Buddhist mythology. It's a, also a very kind of significant part of the Diamond Sutra or the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. The Buddha in that sutra references this event uh, a few times. 
this receiving the prophecy of prediction from Dipankara. What we didn't know was that there was a little boy also at that time, and that when the little boy saw Manavaka receive the prophecy, the little boy vowed to help out Manavaka when he becomes Shakyamuni. So that's where the sutra starts to get really wild, where you know it's not even recursive or self-referential. It's self-referential in all of these wild ways. Um, and we don't need to get too into how wild all of that is, but I did want to kind of mention maybe two things about that story. So the one thing that I think is probably the most important to this sutra, and it's kind of the most important to, well, whatever, it's, it's going to be the most important for tonight. So this Buddha, Dipankara, the lamplighter. <laughs> so I don't think it's uh, you know a coincidence that the Buddha that they chose to reference in this sutra, the manifestation of lights, I don't think it's a coincidence that they chose to focus on this story of the lamplighter Buddha. Now, the thing about this lamplighter Buddha is... Well, if, well, you should know that it is the, um, the prophecy of enlightenment. It's a very old Buddhist story, very much a part of what would be called the Hinayana or the kind of the original teachings. So it's, it's a story that's been around for forever in that sense. But the Mahayana tradition, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, it's sort of, it gets very interested in that Dipankara story. And what I mean is, is that in the early school of Buddhism, it does seem to be a kind of a folk story, something that in a way did happen in the past. And, or, but in the Mahayana, what happens is, is that they basically start talking about the Buddhas of the three times, meaning the Buddhas of the past, Buddhas of the present, and Buddhas of the future. So in that schema of past, present, and future Buddhas, those three time periods, they kind of come to, well, I'll just say this very bluntly, Dipankara Buddha eventually just comes to symbolize the Buddha of the past. Shakyamuni, Siddhartha, our Buddha, even though he has passed away, we still study Siddhartha, or we still study Shakyamuni's Dharma, his sutras, the Dharma that was turned 2,500 years ago, and so there's a way in which even though he has passed away, Shakyamuni is the Buddha of the present, because again, that's whose Dharma we study. And then Maitreya, who get, got mentioned in this sutra, Maitreya be, it represents the future Buddha. And he is the future Buddha, but he also just represents future Buddhas versus present Buddhas versus past Buddhas. I tell you this, the kind of more meta schema, because in that, Dipankara Buddha is kind of like the first Buddha, sort of, kind of, because he lit the lamp. And the idea is, is that the lamp, the flame of the lamp of the Dharma has been passed Buddha to Buddha to Buddha in that sense, in that way. So I just want to point out that they're, they're drawing this kind of connection with the past Buddha, but I think they're doing it in a very interesting way. Um, it's, yeah, it's getting a, a little late to kind of start to start this conversation. So I just want you to know that in a sutra like this, 
And basically in all Mahayana sutras, time is a very tricky thing. <laughs> and so they're not really stuck in sequential ideas of time, but they start there. They start with this idea of the past, the present and the future. But just like it happened in this sutra, and especially, I forget what night that was that I went deep in, into the self-referential nature of these sutras, but a lot of the, a lot of the language is about this kind of, well, there's two, um, there's two thinkers, they actually are riff off of each other. There's two Western European thinkers. One is uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzsche, the German philosopher, and then this kind of early pioneer of the field of religious studies named Mircea Iliada. Both of those thinkers, and actually Iliada got it from Nietzsche, but they talk about an idea called the eternal return. And it's a very, in, in fact, uh, Iliada, uh, Mir Mircea Iliada is the guy's name. And he, believe it, he isn't have, even has a whole book called The Myth of the Eternal Return. And a little bit of it is going on in this sutra, which is kind of like, it has to do with what the Buddha was saying to Moonlight with this idea of like, and that was you then. And that was, and I was that person. And now, and it was all for this sutra. And what I'm getting at is, is that a sutra like this kind of wants the manifestation of lights sutra, like the manifestation of light sutra to be this eternally recurring sutra. And it happened during the time of Dipankara Buddha. It happened during the time of Shakyamuni. And then the idea is, is it's happening now literally right now because we're doing it we're reading it and so a sutra like this really wants to draw us into the the narrative of this sutra so that we aren't just sort of reading something we're experience experiencing something and so i would suggest that that's a big part of the the language play in these sutras regarding time, where it's about the past, but don't you remember that was you? So, okay. So that pretty much concludes it. Any questions, answers, comments, ideas, epiphanies, realizations, insights? Good joke. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I have a question uh -huh. uh, about suchness. Yeah. Is suchness sort of a, I guess, uh, codependently arising with emptiness? Like emptiness implies suchness and suchness implies emptiness, or they are my way off? No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a, a thing about emptiness is a statement about svabhava about self nature and things not having self nature mm -hmm. but as i often say when we understand emptiness it's not that things disappear into little clouds of smoke and it's like ah where'd right. the clock go it's empty so emptiness is about svabhava tathata is about well then well then well then what then what then here all this this stuff that is is that yeah okay good good thank you that was a new new understanding for me you did it then <laughs> <laughs> man those mahayana sutras pack it in don't they and again i actually only scratched the surface of this sutra it's very long a lot of other things going on in it so yeah um, all right. On that note, I'm just going to, I'll mention it uh, really quickly. 
Uh, so I'm going to take a little break. Uh, so I'm going to take the next two Sundays off. And then we will resume our uh, Dharma doors or I'll be back on, I believe that's Sunday the 9th. Mm -hmm. So won't be here on the 26th. Merry Christmas and all that. Won't be here on the 2nd. Happy New Year and all that. But then I'll be back on the 9th. And I'm not a, quite sure what we're going to do. Obviously, it'll be a sutra. Um, but I'm going to spend the next two weeks actually kind of mapping out next year a little bit and putting a little more thought into a kind of a game plan for us for the long term. So, yep. So on that note, once again, happy holidays, happy new year, everybody. So great to be here with you. And I look forward to seeing you in the new year. <laughs>